Hi, I'm Dave Sprogis, a member of Talk of the Town Toastmasters in the Boston area. Organizing your speech or presentation can be a daunting task. Fortunately, most speeches can be organized using the classic three-part structure, also known as the Rule of Three. According to Wikipedia, the Rule of Three is more humorous, satisfying, or effective than other organizational patterns. It is more likely to be remembered because it combines brevity with rhythm efficiently. This helps make the speaker appear knowledgeable while being simple and catchy. As you will see, the rule of three also applies at every level of your speech. The overall structure, the examples or points in the body, and trinomials, trinomials, such as the one in the first sentence, humorous, satisfying, or effective. Fellow Toastmasters and welcome guests, who among you is unfamiliar with these classic children's books? Each book offers lessons using the classic rule of three organization. Think the rule of three is just for kids? Think again. The Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, Scrooge is visited by three ghosts, past, present, and future. In Fiddler on the Roof, Tevier's struggles focus on three of his daughters. And the three musketeers, well, are three until a fourth one joins. <coughs> Slogans and catchphrases also make use of the rule of three. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Stop, look, and listen. And we don't need to put words to the third one. I'm sure that it resonates with all of you just by looking at the pictures. The rule of threes can be seen across cultures and across time. And comedy makes great use of the rule of three. The first two elements of the joke establish a pattern, and the third one breaks the pattern in an unexpected ray. I can't think of anything worse after a night of drinking than waking up next to someone and not being able to remember their name, or how you met, or why they're dead. The rule of threes has even established subgenres of jokes that start with three participants, an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman, or a priest, a rabbi, and a minister. In fact, this pattern is so common that virtually every culture of man has some kind of variation. And if you watched these guys, you'll notice that they employ the rule of three in their antics, doing something wrong in three different ways. <laughs> Dr. King was king of the rule of three, and his words resonate to this day as a result. Here is a passage from one of Dr. King's articles titled, Nonviolence and Racial Justice, and a section within called, A Peace That Was No Peace. In this one paragraph, Dr. King uses the rule of three in two ways, one reinforcing the other. The first use, highlighted in bold, frames and then reframes the peace of the Jim Crow South. Dr. King starts by acknowledging that a sort of racial peace existed, then reframes this peace as an uneasy peace, then reframes it again as a negative peace and the reader is left to question the notion of, peace, <laughs> notion of peace entirely. Looking more closely, Dr. King uses trinomials to describe conditions. About the current peace, an uneasy peace, King notes the suffering of insult, injustice, and exploitation. Then he notes that peace is not the absence of tension, confusion, or war, but is the presence of justice, goodwill, and brotherhood. Dr. King was not only a craftsman of language, but a purveyor of hope, aspirations, and objectives. While these words were intended to be read, I believe they were also designed to be spoken, and I can hear Dr. King's voice boom as I read them, and I bet you can too. Here is a trinomial in law designed to clarify what is expected of the witness, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And more broadly, we understand that legal cases have three phases, opening statements, presentation of the evidence, and closing arguments. 
We all learn this stuff in school probably a couple dozen times, but you might not remember and need a refresher. Let's take a closer look. Consciously or unconsciously, your audience is having an internal conversation with themselves. You want to tap into that conversation and satisfy these questions at each step in the conversation. What are some of the ways you might answer these questions? Why should I listen? Well, the speaker seems nice, maybe entertaining, easy to follow, maybe an expert, and the content seems interesting. Why should I believe? Content is easy to understand, relevant, fits together in some way, and possibly tells a story. What should I take away? Well, the summary is reasonable or conclusion is persuasive. Recommendations or calls to action seem compelling. Let's create an example of a lecture by Professor David Sprogis. First off, as a professor, I deserve to be introduced. Third-party introductions not only give the speaker credibility, but also establish the context of the speech. Professor David Sprogis teaches college physics. In his speech, he will give us an overview of the laws of physics. Please help me welcome Dave. Sadly, outside of Toastmasters, introductions are uncommon. The speaker must frequently introduce himself. Now you're into the beginning of your speech. One way is to start broadly and then narrow down to the subject matter. Physics is the study of how the universe behaves. We describe how the universe behaves through the laws of physics. You may be familiar with Newton's laws of motion. Newton's laws help us predict what objects in motion will do. This is useful in avoiding collisions or ensuring collisions. Other laws help us predict electricity, pressure, temperature, light, and energy. But the laws in physics are not perfect. We know this because in some cases they conflict. Let's understand how two sets of laws in physics conflict and what that conflict means. To repeat, we started broadly and then narrowed to the subject matter of conflicting laws. What's more, the audience will be expecting to learn some meaning behind the conflict. Now we need to substantiate the claims made in the beginning. Newtonian physics describes the behavior of objects large enough to see. Quantum mechanics describes the behavior of objects too small to see. The primary conflict in the laws of physics is between Newtonian physics and quantum mechanics. If I am presenting with visual aids, I might have representations of the subject matter, such as the ones above, to help people recall memories and give them a starting point for the new information. I would then go on to give examples of each of the sets of laws and then highlight the conflict between them. Here comes the juice, the meaning that I promised in the beginning. We don't know everything. Our understanding of physics is patchy and incomplete. Research projects such as the CERN Collider periodically provide new insights and clues which we eventually expect to lead to a unified understanding of physics. Until then, the laws that we have today help us keep tires on the road, planes in the air, and satellites in space. In short, the laws we have are stepping stones to the laws we don't yet have. The summary or conclusion ties together the evidence from the middle and then completes the promise made in the beginning. Let's take a closer look at the middle section. I sequence the physics lecture like a Venn diagram. One set of laws, another set, and then the conflict in between. The most basic alternative is to simply give three examples that create a whole impression. Another alternative is a progression which, sugge which suggests something growing or getting bigger and, of course, the, the progression could be shrinking, like glaciers or endangered animals. Another alternative is something too cold, something too hot, and then something just right. Others include past, present, and future, 
or spatial. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. Use your imagination, and I'm sure you can think of more. Use the rule of three throughout your speech. Have a clear beginning, middle, and end. Make sure that your end ties back to your beginning in some way. And select a, a good structure for the middle that drives toward your ending. Then, sprinkle trinomial strategically to add cadence to create memorable points. Always keep your message simple. Rethink it, rewrite it, and rehearse it until it is simple. Be ruthless in managing scope, what's in and what's out. Manage your structure so that the listener keeps up. Detours make it harder. Avoid big words unless your audience knows them or unless you are teaching them to your audience. And I will leave you with a final thought from Mr. Rogers. There are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. The third way is to be kind. <laughs>